So bonjour dem magna duck ni gone way with him dis na cost na mago shin do dem bangi pegwis and don't chi uh bay and dao uh bangi gisna well actually gichi gisna gichi zukapin aguajing uh, I want to invite all of our relatives out there. I want to just acknowledge all of our relatives. Uh, we always should do that, eh? We should do that all the time when we're thinking about our, our non-human relatives out there. Uh, whenever we do this work where we're talking about land and we're talking about relationships. Because really, those are who teach us. So I just want to acknowledge all of our relatives. And Zukapun is very uh, uh, boisterous today. <laughs> and so uh, my children and I getting up out of the house this morning was quite a drama. Uh, and so it's nice to uh, Zukapun snow, right? So uh, Gisina is cold. So I, I just want to acknowledge our, our friends out there who are reminding us that they are there. Uh, so hello, everybody. It's nice to see everybody. It's nice to see back at CMU. You know, I come here. Uh, once a year or so, except for the, the School of Peace Building. I actually think that my students love the School of Peace Building because they got to spend an entire day with John Saul, who we brought in, remember? So John's a, John's a very good friend of mine, and so he, he, I, pulled him, I pulled a favor in, and he came and spent a whole day here at the Canadian School of Peace Building, and he ended up spending the whole day with my class. He's only supposed to be there for an hour, spent the whole day with us, which is pretty amazing. And so, uh, and yeah, so it was a, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here back at CMU, and I... Um, there's a couple things I wanted to say. I wanted to say first miigwech for the Asema. Um, amazing that we also have it from Peguis. So uh, that's amazing because we're really going to talk about land today. And we're going to talk about, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the post-removal years at Peguis, but they were brutal. And the fact that now we have medicine and knowledge keepers who are growing Asema in uh, Peguis is remarkable. It's pretty remarkable if you know the story of the clearing of that land and the flooding of that territory and the fact that people can live there at all in what is, uh, I'm thinking of our relatives today from four First Nations who are going to be offered $91 million for the flooding of their territory. And, uh, you know, Peguis is still outstanding uh, for the um, atrocious situation they were put into uh, and I say they because they really split our community into two parts. Uh, the Little Pegwa side, the Bungi Pegwa side, which is the part at the St. Peter settlement, and then uh, the Pegwa's First Nation side, the Fisher River side, which is up in the interlake. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Um, who really, uh, I don't know. Uh, I say I'm from Pegwa's. You know, the funny thing is, I've never really been to Pegwis much. Uh, when I was a kid, I went up there a little bit for ceremonies here and there, but I've always grown up on Little Pegwis, on our traditional homelands. Uh, I've never not been there. So it's kind of a weird situation to be from a, a community uh, where I grew up and uh, have connections to another community that really is not my own. And uh, I just want to acknowledge, of course, that uh, we are connected, but we have experienced a great uh, emotional upheaval as a community. And, you know, when I was growing up, before I get into what I'm going to talk about today, when I was growing up, I always heard these stories of uh, removal and what's often called ethnic cleansing and genocide uh, forced removal, relocation. I always heard these, these stories about the Middle East, right? And you hear about situations in Africa, particularly South Africa, which I spent a great deal of amount of time in. But I had no idea that I grew up on a land where ethnic cleansing had been performed. And the genocide of that, uh, the trauma of that, lived in my everyday life. Uh, and it lived in the silence. For me, uh, trauma and violence, the legacies of trauma and violence live in silence. That's where it lives the most. It's the things that people don't talk about. And for those of us who have residential school members in our family, we experience that uh, very much as a part of our everyday life. They don't often, our, our relatives won't speak about residential school, but for us at Bungi Peguis, at Little Peguis, uh, our experience, our life was created in the modern day from that moment of trauma, which is now uh, 111 years old, coming up to the 111th year. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, that, but I also want to talk a little bit about the legacies of what's been created as a result of that removal. And so hopefully we'll spend a little bit of time, we're going to talk about some things that are tough today, but, but I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about the resilience of Peguis as well. So, but I don't want to start there. 
because uh, those of you who are literary students, where's my literary peeps out there? Where's my literary students? There's one of them. Yeah, everyone else is kind of embarrassed about it. Yes, I know. I'm a, P, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a literary guy. I am not, I never planned to do all this stuff, like, you know, to go out and be this political. I, I found it very weird preparing this talk because I'm normally talking about treaty or I'm talking about Trudeau. That's all the T's. Eh? Tr treaties or Trudeau or trauma, right? And, and now I'm, I get to talk about my own community. I get to talk about my own experience. I don't often get to do that. And so, but I want to start with something uh, more, um, what I think to be more poignant. So, in 1971, uh, Daphne Ojig, anyone know who that is? All right, so Daphne Ojig, the, the great Potawatomi artist, had spent about five years in Manitoba by that point, and she had traveled around. Uh, her, her husband, uh, Chester Bevon, uh, had worked for uh, Indige Indian, Indian Affairs, of course, now Indigenous Affairs, and she traveled around uh, Manitoba. And she spent a lot of time in two communities. One was Easterville. Does anyone know about the history of Easterville? Uh, the Easterville was the place in which the Chemawawin Cree had been located, relocated as a result of Manitoba hydro dams. Um, that time period that Daphne spent with the Chemawawin Cree in Easterville was very formative for her because what she experienced was a people who were at the very cusp, at the very beginning of removal. They had had a radical change of their way of life from living on the land to now living in an urban space. And as you may have expected, the outcomes of that were traumatic. Uh, substance abuse rose. Um, family atrophies, community atrophies, never mind the fact that governance systems were completely obliterated by the move into the city. And for the Chemawawan Cree, it was a very difficult time. And, and for the first time in her life, she began to sketch drawings and give them away as gifts. And you can still see these around Manitoba, uh, Daphne Ojig's original drawings. Um, I, I know that because I had one growing up. Every time I'd eat cereal every morning, my parents had been given this uh, wedding gift, which was an Ojig sketch of a uh, Chemawawan cabin. And uh, I just stared at it every day. I had no idea what I was looking at every day. But it was the, the, when she would spend time with elders, she would hear them describe their homes. She would sketch it and then give it away to communities to help them remember where they came from while living in Easterville. Now, she did that with many other things, too. She drew pictures of ceremonial gatherings, kids playing, activities, and so on. But the point of it is, is that Daphne Ojig's career, first off, began in Manitoba, her artistic career. Second is, her uh, first initial drawings were one of describing the experience of removal. And that brings me to 1971. The other community that she spent a lot of time with was the people of Peguis, who she uh, had met, uh, spent a little bit of time with, but predominantly had traveled with Chester to a tour uh, with the people of Peguis up in the Interlake. And what she had experienced there was uh, she created a great deal of relationships, and she did a little bit of sketching here and there, but she mostly just created relationships along her travels. So that when in 1971, by this point, Daphne's career had expanded and catapulted herself into a national consciousness, what would later be known as the Indian Group of Seven, and heading up her small art gallery on just off uh, Broadway there in downtown near the Friendship Center, the first Friendship Center in Canada, soon enough will be the burgeoning and the beginning of Indigenous visual art in the country not Inuit art, that starts a little bit earlier, but, but for First Nations art, uh, Norval Morisot, Alex Janvier, all of the big ones, it starts here in Winnipeg. As I will always say, uh, life always begins here in Manitoba. I'm a little biased. They don't like hearing that in Toronto very much, by the way. But um, it starts here. It starts right here in Winnipeg. And Ojig, by this point, was asked by the province of Manitoba in 1971 to do a mural. And at the same time, she was also, by the, also asked by the community of Peguis to also do a mural at the exact same time. And so, in good uh, Anishinaabe style, she decided to be politically subversive and create two murals, both connected to each other, but in two different locations. One is in Peguis, uh, installed in Peguis Central School. It's there today. You can go up and drive up and see it. Uh, maybe don't go during the school day, a little busy up there, but uh, check it out. The second is installed in the Manitoba Museum. 
and you can go and see it today. Go drive over there. I was there. Uh, I was there on Monday. Uh, it's still there. It's actually just been refurbished. And I want to show you these two murals because uh, I, I wish I could spend a lot of time encapsulating, engaging, uh, con deconstructing these images. But I just want to tell you the quick story of what it's all about. This is the one that's installed at Pegwa Central School. It's called the Great Flood. Now, in the center of the image is our uh, creation being. I don't call them tricksters because it's a terrible misnomer. It's, uh, they don't play tricks, they, they create creation. That's what they are. And so this is Wenaboju, or also known as Nanaboju or Nanabush. And you know, Wenaboju at this point, what is Wenaboju doing? Well, first off, Wenaboju is looking at all of the uh, beings of creation. And in a trepidated face, looks out to all of the other beings, notice that there's a turtle, notice that there's a, a raccoon, and uh, the first one I really want you to notice is notice that there is an eagle turning into a thunderbird. Um, there's also a, a moose, and so on. Notice all the interconnectedness. Notice the, the fluidity, the fullness, a creation that is very full, very active, very vibrant, very mobile, is full of emanating waves of beauty and hue. But there's a moment of, of uh, urgency. It's a moment of fear almost. It's the trepidated face of Wenaboju that I want, to, want us to focus on for just a minute. As Wenaboju looks out, you can see that there is something happening in creation. There is a, a, a disjuncture, a change happening. And what m this thing that is happening is on the bottom of the image, which is that water is beginning to flood the world. Now, if you know the creation story for us as Anishinaabe, it talks about uh, humanity forgetting their relationships with not just each other, but also with everything around us. And I was with a bunch of kids, one grade ones and twos yesterday, telling this story. And what they said at the end is, is that humanity forgot how to be nice. And so humanity had forgotten about their relationships to each other. And so the world had to be washed. It had to be recreated. But with that, of course, came a great deal of death and destruction and pain. And now I wish I had a lot more time to talk about this, but I just want you to look at in Wenaboju's hands. What is in Wenaboju's hands? And it's very faint, and you may not be able to see it at the beginning, at the back. What is it? Uh, looks like an umbilical cord. That's a good one. But he's kind of looking at it, right? It's a Geshwentha. Do you know what the Geshwentha is? It's the Tura Wampum, the Tura Wampum Treaty. So uh, what went about, notice how the, the Wampum Treaty is uh, spiraling. It's, be, it's being challenged. Okay, so I just want you to remember that. Now that's the one in Peguis. So it is a moment of community, beauty, hue, of growth, fluidity, but also a moment of profound disjuncture of change. And that's in Peguis. Here is the mural in the Manitoba Museum, which you've probably all seen. Who's seen this one? You've all seen it, right? Everyone has seen it. It's called the creation of the world. Now, if the first image is what happens before a flood, this is the image which happens after the flood, after the death and destruction, the recreation of the earth. Uh, Ojig installs in 1971. Uh, this image in the Manitoba Museum. Now, what's the Manitoba Museum? Well, it's supposed to be the place of history, the place of growth, the place of knowledge. It's like a university, a place in which you instill the knowledge that has value. Here is, in the Manitoba Museum, the creation of the world, the recreation of life after death and destruction. Now, I want you just to look at the mural here. Notice the Thunderbird as having now become a spirit, or what we refer to as a manaduk. It has now entered into the spirit world. Notice how it begins here, and has now entered into the atmosphere, has entered into the manaduk. Uh, that thunderbird represents the death. Now, notice how, this is the story, of course, of the, uh, the muskrat that goes down. Everyone's kind of, if you've been to Manitoba, you've kind of heard this story about the muskrat that goes down, gets that last piece of earth so that everything, Wenaboju can recreate the land for everyone to stand on. Um, here's the muskrat right here. Muskrat's right here. And then, of course, Wenaboju recreates land on top of a turtle. My point is, is that this painting is about recreating land after devastation. How do you do that? You do it through patience, you do it through commitment, and most markedly, you must need the best parts of the old earth to recreate the new. The, the waves are still there. 
Notice how the threats are still present. The water is still only one uh, wave away from recreating the destruction of before. But Ojig instills in the Manitoba Museum an image of recreation. For me, these two images, both created in 1971, which is important for Manitoba, why? It's the centennial. Now, what's this, what, do you, what do you do on a birthday? You give a gift, right? Here is OJ giving a profound gift to Manitoba in two murals. One is about the, how you prepare for a flood and death and devastation, and how do you remake life after the dev death and devastation. That's a message to Manitoba that ain't exactly one of happy birthday. That's a message to Manitoba to say, what have you done and what do we do now? Now, there are many positive messages, uh, kindness, belief, taking a piece of the old earth and remaking it. But she also reminds us that we are only one wave away from recreating the death and devastation that had happened when to do, have the flood happen. And if you know the story today of Manitoba Hydro, of the relocations of Indigenous peoples across Manitoba still happening today, Lake St. Martin comes to mind, we are still in that time. We are still in a time where indigenous peoples are, are experiencing massive floods, devastation, and death in their territories, um, in their lands, right here in Winnipeg. But I want us to focus on these two images for just a moment. Why would Ojig install uh, a story about preparing for a flood in Peguis and creating a story in Winnipeg about how do you um, recover from a flood? Well, that means that the flood had to happen somewhere because we got the beginning and we got the end. Well, it's not really the end, but we got the beginning and then the next chapter. But where's the flood? Where's the flood story? Well, I want us just to think about it uh, in terms of, uh, I do work with graphic novels. Uh, do you, anyone do work with graphic novels? Well, you know, if you see, uh, if you see a person in one panel walk in with a, with a gun, and then you see the next panel, the gun is smoking. What has happened? You have to do that in your own head. It, what happens between the gun arriving and the gun smoking is the space in the middle, which happens in your head. That's the space for graphic novelists, we call it the gutter. It's the space between the panels. It's the place where action happens, but it happens more interestingly in your head than it happens anywhere else. Where is the panel for this incredible graphic novel that Ojig created the beginning and the end of? I want you just to look right here. Here we are in Peguis, right here. Here we are in Winnipeg, right here. And what is right between there? Selkirk. In between the panel where the flood happens is Selkirk. That is, ex that is so brilliant, it's unbelievable. The story of Manitoba, um, the, uh, the ground zero story of what we talk about in Manitoba in 1971, Ojig was talking about Selkirk, the place that I grew up. Now I'm a very proud Selkirkian. I grew up my entire life in Selkirk, uh, except for a couple years. We a pit stop in Ashern, pit stop in Brandon, but right back to Selkirk for my high school years. I've lived my whole life in Selkirk. I'm very proud to be there. Um, I just received the Rotary Community Person Award or whatever it was. Uh, Paul Harris Fellow, I really, um, I was an exchange student from Selkirk. I went and represented Selkirk across the world. Uh, I'm very proud of being from Selkirk. And you don't hear a lot of Selkirk people saying that too much for some reason. I think it's great, but, um, but you know, Selkirk's a very important part of my life. But I can tell you that my entire life, I worked, in the, I worked in the high school, I was the president of my class, I, I worked in the Friendship Center. Not once in my entire life did I ever hear about what had happened to make Selkirk what it was. Not once. If you go to Selkirk right now, uh, you will not find any monument or sign or reminder of what had happened at Selkirk, which is that Selkirk is the site of ethnic cleansing. 
It is the site uh, just north of Selkirk, in the town of Selkirk, where a genocide was perpetrated of that we imagine happening in the Middle East, that we imagine happening in areas across the world where we condemn them and wag our finger at them. But in Selkirk, it happened, and nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about it. Uh, it's not that people don't know about it, because I was out, out at the Rotary Club giving a speech a couple months ago, and everybody knows about it, but just nobody wants to talk about it. But what happened in Selkirk was uh, an instance of what we continue to do in Manitoba involving our relationships and is probably the biggest blemish, if not the biggest obstacle, that we have to reconciliation in our community. And that was what I hope to talk about today, is how do we then take what Ojig's message is in the Manitoba Museum and say, where do we go from here? How do we keep those waves uh, away from us so that we can recreate land for all of us to stand on? Uh, I want to show you just a brief video about uh, some of the history of Pegwis, which can do a way better job. It's a little dated. It's Jim Compton. Do you know Jim Compton? from way back in the day, right? Um, it's a video that was sent to me by a Pegwis member a couple days ago, and uh, James Favel, who runs the Bear Clan. Uh, it's about his grandfather, but we're not gonna watch that part, so we're gonna watch the part on, on the history of, of Pegwis. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about the removal. I don't know if you want to close a few curtains, but if you, if you can see it fine, then that's fine. The Pegwis Band story begins here, in what the Cree Indians call Death River. More than two centuries ago, smallpox swept through the families that camped on its banks, killing most of the people. These days, we call this area Netley Creek. It's at the mouth of the Red River. In the late 1700s, a Soto Band, led by a chief called Pegwis, arrived here from an area we now call Ontario. They were looking for abundant wildlife, and they found it here, along with abandoned Cree encampments. Pegwis and his people made the creek and the Red River their home, but their life soon changed forever. With the blessing of the Hudson's Bay Company, in 1811, Lord Selkirk sent a group of Scottish settlers to the Red River. Pegwis welcomed them and became a steady friend of the settlers. He fed them when they were starving, and he supported them when the Hudson's Bay Company fought with the rival Northwest Company over the fur trade. And finally, in 1817, he signed his mark to a treaty which gave Selkirk access to thousands of acres along the Red and Assiniboine Rivers. Without Pegwis' support, the fortune of Selkirk's Red River settlement would have been very different. But in just a few decades, the tables would be turned, and Pegwis' people would not get the same treatment. After Pegwis died, his son Henry Prince became chief and took over the job of protecting the band's interests. White settlers were increasingly hungry for land. So in 1871, to preserve some land for his people, Prince signed another treaty. It created a St. Peter's Reserve, rich and valuable agricultural land on both sides of the Red River, stretching from the town of Selkirk, 12 miles north to the Netley Marsh. Despite the treaty, the conflict over the land continued. What followed was 30 years of total confusion confusion over the status of reserved land already owned by the Indians, confusion over whether they had the right to own and sell that land, and confusion over the rights of non-Indians who owned land on the reserve. Six separate investigations and a court case couldn't settle the matter. Finally, in 1906, Manitoba's Chief Justice, Hector Howell, became a one-man royal commission. His job was to find a resolution to the confusion and conflict over the reserve even if it meant getting the Indians to surrender their land. I made up my mind that for the good of the Indian tribe, beyond any question, they ought to get off that reserve. And as for the neighborhood, it would be a vast advantage. I felt the Indian reserve there was a black spot. The white community at Selkirk and Indian Affairs officials supported Howell's conclusion. They wanted the land to go to the white farmers, and they thought the Indian should be moved away from the temptations of liquor. But at three separate meetings in 1907, the band almost unanimously rejected the idea of giving up their reserve. This 600-page target... Okay, uh, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. So, uh, turn, the, turn the light back on for a moment. Uh, 
Okay, so a uh, little history lesson. We just zoomed across about 140 years there. Um, but I just want to get the work done as quickly as possible. So uh, Peguis and his accompanying uh, relatives arrive at Nabuin Isipi, which is uh, Death River or Netley Creek. And we arrive in about 1770. But we had been using that territory for hunting and fishing for a very long period of time. We settle, for the most part, because of a smallpox epidemic along the Red River. Uh, those at Netley Creek, the Creek community was virtually decimated. They say that anywhere up to 95% of the population would, what had, had, um, had passed away. And so Pegwis became a leader on the Red River very quickly. And he was also very known as a good orator. And what Pegwis did upon the arrival of Selkirk was commit to the Selkirk Treaty. Now, you may have heard a little bit of buzz about the Selkirk Treaty this year, A, because um, the, the, the Premier decided to do this bike ride to remind of us of the Selkirk Treaty, which I'm not going to comment too much a little bit, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I did make a lot of comments in the media, <laughs> check it out. Um, and uh, uh, that's, there's a funny story about that if you remind me later. But, it, but um, the bottom line of it is that the Selkirk Treaty is a commitment between Selkirk and Pegwis, and most interestingly, it does two things. One is, is that it recognizes uh, British and French and Scottish, uh, British and Scottish particularly, but French as well, um, presence along the Red River. Now, as you can see, the dots on the map are of, represent settlement. And this is why we are all here. This is why I have British and Scottish. This is why I'm a Sinclair, um, because of the connection between the British and Scottish, the Selkirk settlers, and the commitment that they made with Selkirk. Now, Pegwis makes the choice to support, at that time, the British and Scottish settlement, but it was still very much in doubt whether it was going to be um, a, a large British and Scottish presence or what was, that was going to take place. So you have to remember, this is a very interesting time period where Pegwis holds the balance of power. This is not Upper and Lower Canada post-War of 1812 where the lands are being flooded exponentially. Indigenous peoples in Manitoba still have the balance of power at this time. And so Pegwis begins to give allotments. That's what those dots are. Um, now, what is understood by allotments? That doesn't mean ownership, because Pegwis has often been thought of, oh, he sold the land. No, he didn't. Um, why would you sell all of the land by the river? It was, clear, it was clear by that offering of allotments, not that he gave up land, but that he offered a partnership and a family, which brings to the second point. Look at the signatures that Pegwis uses. The Pegwis, the, the, the Pegwis and the four other chiefs along the Red River use clan signatures, which would never denote ownership. What they would denote is relationship, meaning that uh, as we had been accepted into creation, this is our creation story, as we had been offered uh, friendship and family by the animals, particularly the bears, look at the signatures, the bear, the marten, two fish, nothing more Manitoba than a catfish and a bull, and then snake. Um, as we had been accepted and adopted by the animals, you now too, we adopt you as well as family, not friends. And so Selkirk was being offered the relationship of family. And family doesn't cut people off from parts of the house. They share the house together. So it's not about selling land, but yet the kind of sense of title which Pegwis was offering, which was that we have relationship and related to territory, and that Pegwis is the one who is recognizing British and Scottish presence along the Red River, is important to understand. Because what is that recognizing? Well, you know, we're often told that we, uh, by signing a, a beside British and French signatures, that we have to represent and recognize Canadian law. Well, this is evidence right here that the first Manitoba law that was recognized by any sort of uh, um, European was Indigenous law. And that was the kind of ownership uh, not, title that we're talking about here. The second thing to understand is that Pegwis uh, was very shrewd. And so for the next 60 years, while he began to create relationships, he did many different things that are very important. One is that he chose to Christianize. He chose to baptize himself, call himself William King. And he did that because he said to Lord Selkirk, what's the name of your leader? And Selkirk said, well, that's a king. And he says, good, that'll be my name, William King. And he said, what's the name of the sons of the king? And uh, Selkirk said, well, that's the prince. And he says, that will be the names of my sons. And that's why the name Prince 
is so powerful at Pegwis because that's the story of that name. And so uh, as Pegwis began to adopt, he baptized himself, which created an incredible fracture in the community at Pegwis. In fact, there was a very strong Medewin presence along the Red River at this point. But because of that presence of Christianity and William Cochran and particularly Reverend Cochran, um, there was a real sort of division in the community around Christianity and traditional beliefs, but I don't have a lot of time to talk about that. The bottom line is to understand that the Selkirk Treaty is the first recognition of Indigenous law by Europeans in Manitoba. And what's the first thing Canada does upon giving Manitoba to the Hudson Bay Company? It says the Selkirk Treaty doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't, we don't recognize it. And so Rupert's Land is the first intrusion of Canada is a violation of Indigenous law that has already been recognized by the presence of settlers in Manitoba. But that's important in which to understand because that creates the St. Peter settlement. Now for the, past, for the next 60 years, even upon Pegwis' death, uh, there is a kind of general recognition on the Red River that Pegwis and his family are the ones who are being able to give allotments. Now, for Europeans, that means ownership. For Indigenous peoples, that means relationship. And these are important ways to understand, and there's a kind of constant back and forth of what does that really mean until 1871 with Treaty 1 happens and the expiration of the uh, Hudson Bay uh, control, the rise of the Métis Provisional Government and so on, the Manitoba Act. And in the, in the language of the Manitoba Act, they specifically designate that the St. Peter's Band is outside of that and have particular land ownership or land allotments which creates the St. Peter's Reserve at the Manitoba Act in 1870. Now at this time, uh, William Prince, the son of Pegwis, begins to recognize and create uh, that there is specific needs because settlers are coming in and flooding into Manitoba. Very quickly, the St. Peter's Band experiences squatters on their territory, who then they have to negotiate with to create allotments, even within the St. Peter's Reserve. And Paul Burroughs, who's written an amazing master's thesis on the topic, check it out, says that up until 1907, by this point, this reserve, which was created along the Red River, out north Selkirk, just from the border of Selkirk. If I tell you guys areas in Selkirk, well, you know, like Manitoba Avenue, if you go, Mani you know, movie theater, the Gourd, the, uh, what's the bar there? It's a big bar in Selkirk. I can't remember it. I used to go there all the time. Um, uh, Manitoba Avenue North, all the way to the St. Peter's Church, all the way up to Net Netley Creek. And so that is all reserved territory, but people had began to squat there or they had negotiated land titles, uh, land deeds from Pegwis and his family. And they held on to those deeds so that when the Manitoba Act creates the reserve, for the next 30 years, as Jim Compton talks about, there's a whole lot of confusion. Do we recognize that Canada can sell land? Or do we reckon now the Indian Act comes in and of course Indians can't own land except for uh, situations at St. Peter's. Can Indians sell land? Can they give allotments or can they not? And so for the next 30 years, there is a great deal of disjuncture and confusion. And in typical Canadian style, instead of dealing with the, the issue in terms of dealing fairly and equitably with it. And of course, this is the time period when the belief is that Indians are just going to disappear and, and civilize uh, or assimilate. Um, the St. Peter's Band is an anomaly. It's weird. Why? Because they're Christian Indians for the most part. Um, there is indigenous people who are doing Medewin and traditional ceremonies, but for the most part, we have a Christian settlement, for the most part, with English names. Uh, most of them, Scottish and British, have had now relationships for almost, you know, going on 100 years. And <clears throat> the, relation the, the situation involving the St. Peter's, Peter's settlement is very odd because they are economically progressive. And for the most part, indigenous peoples at St. Peter's Settlement are doing very well financially. Not everybody, but, but are, many are, have become farmers, have become agriculturalists. Some are still hunters and fishers, but generally are doing very well economically. And they represent a sort of threat, a sort of weird anomaly. Uh, like it's almost proof that indigenous peoples on their own volition can exist within Canada. But even though they are Christian, even though they are uh, creating, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, 
situations that are bountiful and almost outside the bounds of the Indian Act, it's still not good enough. And in 1906, leading up to that, uh, the Manitoba's uh, Court of Appeals Justice uh, uh, Hewitt um, is appointed to be the commissioner to deal with this situation. And like most leaders in Manitoba, he turns to the town of Selkirk, he turns to the province of Manitoba, and he turns to the uh, government of Canada, and he says, uh, the best thing to do is to remove the Indians. And if we remove the Indians, we can just get rid of the problem. And like almost virtually every situation, uh, this, the decision is, is to simply remove the Indians, put them aside, put them away, so that Canada can march on into the future. Now you have to realize there's a bit of another issue, situations going on here. Uh, this is the post-Northwest resistance uh, movement. There is a general paranoia about Indigenous peoples rising up, and here we have an economically progressive Indigenous community. Yes, Christian, but always kind of one step away from savagery. And so, uh, throughout 1906 and 1907, uh, forces at the Government of Canada, as well as land speculators, go in and they perform a survey at the St. Peter Settlement. What they notice is two things. Two things that they notice. Uh, first is that there is a whole lot of resistance and nobody wants to move. Second is that you have a leadership uh, who have situations involving families who are experiencing poverty. Now, here we are in 1906-1907. Uh, they arrive in September of 1907, in September 20th through 24th. And upon arrival, uh, there has been a well-sprung movement amongst almost the entire chief and council at St. Peter's to say, we do not want to be removed. There's words handed out amongst the St. Peter's membership on September 20th as the government representatives arrive to hold a surrender vote. Um, because uh, they, you must have a legitimate and legal surrender vote in order to remove Indians into another territory. Now, the speculators that arrived, the government representatives, quickly realize that there are so many people arriving at the site of the boat's arrival that they will not get a successful vote that day. And so after holding a meeting, they quickly realize with the chief and council present that they will not win. And so they decide not to hold the vote that day. But that evening, they invite to the boat two meetings, as well as traveling throughout the community. They meet with chief and council members, and miraculously, uh, magically, the chief and council decides by the next day, all you, almost unanimously, to support their surrender. Now, we find out later that what the chief and council has been offered is $5 extra and a whole lot of land each. And at every single meeting was a whole lot of whiskey. Now, throughout that community for the next day, for the next three days, in fact, uh, the other members, leaders of the resistance movement are also visited. Um, and uh, there's also some information gathered so that on the 24th, it's discovered that most people will be gone out hunting or fishing that day. With one small notice uh, posted on the store, uh, there is the announcement that a surrender vote will be held the next day. Uh, nobody really goes to the store every day in those days. They go once a week, sometimes once a month. And on September 24th, 1907, a vote was announced uh, in the store. There was no record of who, kept, who arrived to vote for that day. There was no mentioning uh, of what the meeting was to be held about until it was announced the meeting would begin. And at that time, there were so many people who had still yet arrived, who had been informed of the situation, almost 200, that they couldn't fit them all inside of the store. They couldn't, so what they did was, is they held the first initial meeting completely in English in a community where almost nobody spoke English, and they announced that the vote would take place within minutes. And then they sent everybody outside. And the only words that were announced in Cree that day was, anybody who wants $90, step over here. And miraculously, amazingly, 97 people said no. But 108 people said yes. And within minutes, uh, the Pegwa settlement, the little Pegwa settlement had been surrendered. 
Now, almost immediately, uh, a surrender document, which was previously prepared, was magically created. And you got to think, this is 1907. There's no printer around. Uh, they came ready with that agreement. And the announcement at that point was, all people from this point forward have to leave. 108 to 97, that was the vote. And there was no record of who kept, who was there to vote that day. That means that it could have been anybody. It could have been anybody that was walking in off the street. It didn't have to be St. Peter's members that came in that day. But 108 to 97. And for the next 30 years, 30 years, St. Peter's people uh, were forced to move by the police. They were called squatters, and their land was sold. They, f they would arrive home one day to find that their land had been sold. Uh, people like Murdo Sutherland uh, would uh, sit on the, his, front de his front chair in the front of his house with a shotgun, challenging the, challenging the police, saying, you just try to move me. And he is just an example of the thousands of other people who refuse to move who refuse to leave. Uh, there are so many amazing stories of people like my, with my own family who refuse to leave uh, or moved and joined with their relatives in Brokenhead. Uh, Kent Monkman, the great painter, do you know Kent Monkman? Uh, his grandmother uh, left and went all the way to Kuchiching, right? And went all the way off to, uh, off to you know, other c communities out in Treaty 3 territory. It, you know, one of the, uh, the biggest supporters of the Pegasus removal, of uh, people who took peop uh, families in were people in Treaty 3. And uh, I was out in Kuchiching one day, and I had an elder come up to me and say, are you, a, are you uh, Murray's boy? That's what people say, they always call me. And uh, she says, I'm from St. Peter's too. My grandmother moved here after the removal. That happens to me all the time. But the atrophy of what happened for the next 30 years in our community is remarkable. And the fact that people stayed for 30 years is remarkable. My family moved up a short, for a short time up to Brokenhead, but then moved back down when my grandmother got sick. And we lived at the St. Peter's Indian Hospital, which was right across the river from the St. Peter's Church. Here's the church right here. So my family lived right across the river from that. That is the, Saint, the old stone church at the St. Peter's Reserve. And we lived right across the river from there on uh, small cabins right near the, right near the uh, hospital there, which is now the Healing Center. Have you seen the Healing Center? Uh, just north of Selkirk. And that's where my family lived until eventually in the 1950s, uh, deciding to move into the town of Selkirk. You know, it cannot be emphasized and talked about enough that what happened to the Peguis community as people were slowly removed up to Peguis, those who stayed behind were left virtually orphaned from a community that was forced to leave. And for those of us who are from Peguis, uh, most of us were in situations where we didn't have any chief and council anymore. We didn't have any representatives anymore. Um, we were left to fend for ourselves, especially if you decided to stay behind. Those who moved up to Peguis experienced the same kind of atrophy and struggles and flooding over land that was still floods today, um, like the Chemawawan Cree. So it's not perhaps no surprise at all that Daphne Ojig had, had witnessed that at that point by the 1970s of what removal really looks like. But, you know, for those of us who stayed behind, what we experienced, what we know... What we feel is silence. Silence. And that is perhaps the most traumatic thing of all, because no one really talks about it. And that is the story of our removal. Uh, that is the story for us who stayed behind of what we had experienced. But you know, for many of us in Manitoba, it experienced it was kind of like this. You know, when I was growing up, I grew up on uh, Jemima, which is just off Manitoba Avenue, which would have been the site of the old St. Peter settlement just on the borderland there. Uh, I always wondered, like, why are there Indians everywhere here? It's because I was on a reserve, but it wasn't called it. Uh, why was there, you know, every kid I went to school with a native person? <laughs> they were either First Nations or Métis. But by that point, of course, my grandfather had enfranchised, so we were now so-called, we were called, calling ourselves Métis, even though we grew up very Ojibwe. You know, uh, our experience uh, was much that we, um, 
we didn't really know what was that all about. And as a young guy growing up in Manitoba, it was just because the removal had happened by that point. It had been almost um, 80 years by that point. And so what I wanted to talk, about, talk to you about uh, for just a moment is what happened after the removal. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, we never forget. Those of us, even though there's silence, we never forget, which is kind of, uh, which is why, uh, you know, in, when I spoke about last year, when I spoke to Wendy's class last year, uh, I think I was late or something, right? So I, I sent you the video. So uh, there's a CBC seen and heard, uh, it's like a TED talk kind of thing, um, where you can watch it if you wish. If you, uh, if you don't, that's fine too. But um, you know what my family does uh, since about 1975, 78 in that neighborhood, uh, our family began to hold family reunions and where we invite all parts of our family, those that had been removed, people like the, uh, the Cochrans or people like the Sutherlands, people like the Stevensons, um, people who left and went to communities like Manicotogan, people like the Samards and the Seymours, uh, people that moved and went all the way to Brokenhead or to Winnipeg, people like Saint the Sinclairs, uh, and we come together every year, ironically, on Canada Day. Every July 1st, since 1975, 78, in that neighborhood, almost every single year we come and we do, uh, you know, we go back to the St. Peter's Church and we have a picnic and we make food and we spend time together. And you know the weirdest thing happens because when we get there, nobody talks. The Cochrans are over here, the Sutherland's over here, the Stevenson's over here, the Sinclair's over here, and nobody talks because nobody knows each other. Like, I see them once a year. I don't even know the names of 90% of the people that I'm at my family reunion with. And then the food comes out. And for the first time, people begin to interact with each other. And uh, the, the, the YouTube video you can watch is about my, my auntie's potato salad, because it's one of the most popular things out there. It's, it's like the celebrity cook-off, right? It's like, my auntie is the potato salad. She brings that. But you know, um, then what happens after the food is we have the races. And what we do is we have kid races, adult races, and yep, we have granny and grandpa races too. And for the very first time in the entire day, usually about four or five hours in, uh, as a family, we're actually interacting with each other. We spend time together, we laugh together, and we repossess our homelands together. We come together from the removal together. And it's not through tears, it's through laughter. It's through watching who will win the 80-year-old uh, uh, race, which is usually about a meter long. <laughs> the kids' race have to go 50 meters, but the 80-year-old race is about a meter long. And uh, sometimes we have three-legged races and wheelbarrow races, and we always have a candy scramble. And my, that's my daughter's favorite part. But my point of telling you this story is that uh, by the end of that day, we're all a family again. And every year we prove it. We prove that the removal did not, def did not defeat us. It did not hurt us. Uh, we can still recover from that moment. You know, the, uh, the, the, the town of Selkirk and the city of Pegasus has a very strained relationship. Often the uh, chief of Pegasus, whoever that is for this ter term right now, it's uh, Glenn Hudson, will come to Selkirk and hold an event and you still can see the anger at the leadership of Pegasus. And it's not because of anybody abandoning anybody else, but because we just don't spend a lot of time together. So often Pegasus will need us to support something and we'll refuse to do so because we're not allowed to have any represent representatives on chief and council. Uh, we've been asking for many years to have a specific St. Peter's representative on the chief and council. And they say, we got too many challenges, too many problems. We can't have a representative. We got too many challenges at Pegasus. If you want services and supports, come up to Pegasus. And we'll say, well, that's like three hours away. <laughs> um, and in, the, in return, people at Peg will say, you don't even come up here and visit us. You don't know who we are. And uh, that, that juncture uh, continues. You know what we're really good at? Showing up in court together. To battle things like the removal, 
to battle things like uh, um, you know, getting the Assiniboia Downs and trying to create an economic life or an urban reserve together. We're really good at that. The, the time that uh, Chief Glenn Hudson loves me the most is when I, get to sh when I show up as the expert witness on St. Peter's or on Pegwa's history or on Ojibwe culture. That's when we get along the best. That's when uh, he starts sending me Facebook messages. But when I start talking to him about what a St. Peter's representative, my messages don't get returned. I don't know what that's about. And so, uh, you know, in, in 2007, at 100 years of the removal, from 1907 to 2007, uh, we were offered $121 million in compensation by the federal government who recognized that the, uh, the surrender was not a surrender at all, but a theft. It was legal and unjust, and $121 million was offered to us, uh, which is pittance. You, ta you tell me how much is the town of Selkirk worth? Even if it's just a part of it from Manitoba Avenue north. Uh, there's an airport there, by the way. <laughs> there's a healing center there. Uh, there is billions of dollars of homes there. And we got paid $121 million for that. What that representative was two things. Each one of us got a per cap uh, payment of $1,000. If you were an elder, it was $2,000. Uh, if you, um, or, and then the second thing that we got created was a $90 million fund for community projects. $90 million. That's what removal buys you. And that, uh, that is what the St. Peter's removal creates today is we now have a trust fund that community representatives, all of which live at Peguis, um, control, make decisions upon. Uh, some of us have had access to that fund, be able to create things like court trials in order for us to get uh, compensation for other things. We've used that money for supports for language and culture and so on. But in the end of the day, it's just $90 million. And so it seems like a lot of money, but doesn't go very far. What I want to do is I want to open it up to any questions or any ideas or any, uh, any other stories. There's probably people, here's what I, you know what always happens whenever I talk about St. Peter's? There's always somebody in the audience who has a story about St. Peter's. And maybe that'll happen too, I'm not sure. Uh, but I wanted just to open it up and say a huge miigwech for letting me able to tell that story and tell you about uh, where I come from. So miigwech everybody.